of this wonderful treasure of which we have sung. I may remind you uh, that um, in this portion of Exodus, we're dealing with heavenly things. We have seen from Exodus 25 till this chapter, and actually till chapter 31, that God introduces heavenly things. He wants to dwell among his people in the wilderness. And so let's read from chapter 30, from verse 22, to the end of the chapter. And Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, And thou take best spices of liquid myrrh, five hundred shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, the half, two hundred and fifty, and of sweet myrtle, two hundred and fifty, and of cassia, five hundred, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil a hind, and make of it an oil of holy ointment, a perfume of perfumery, after the work of the perfumer. It shall be the holy anointing oil, and thou shalt anoint the tent of meeting with it, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all its utensils, and the lampstand and its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering, and all its utensils, and the laver and its stand. And thou shalt hallow them, that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them shall be holy. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt anoint, and shalt hallow them, that they may serve me as priests. And thou shalt speak to the children of Israel, saying, A holy anointing oil shall this be unto, my, unto me throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall you make any like it after the preparation of it. It is holy, holy shall it be unto you. Whoever compoundeth any like it, or whoever putteth any of it upon any strange thing, shall be cut off from his peoples. And Jehovah said to Moses, Take fragrant drugs, stacte and onit, onica and galbanum, fragrant drugs and pure frankincense, in like proportions shall it be. And thou shalt make it into incense, a perfume after the work of the perfumer, salted, pure, holy. And thou shalt beat some of it to powder, and put some of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting, where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. And the incense that thou shalt make, ye shall not make for yourselves according to the proportions of it. It shall be unto thee holy to Jehovah. Whoever makes like unto it to smell it shall be cut off from his peoples. So far the reading of the scriptures. Well, beloved, we come to the climax of this, this portion which is before us. As you have understood, and I just repeat it also for the children, the book of Exodus is the book of the names. And the question comes to us, is your name already written in God's book? I've heard that many children, young people have been baptized last week, so I suppose their names have been written in God's book. And when your name is written in God's book, God has a plan for you. That's what you see in the book of Exodus. God wants to have a people for himself in this world. Therefore, he has saved us. Therefore, he delivers us from Egypt. That's a long process, actually. When you go through the beginning of Exodus, you find it. And there the climax is chapter 14 and 15. Passover lamb, God's provision. Then deliverance from the power of Pharaoh, chapter 14 and 15. And then they speak in Moses' song of a habitation. God had in mind to dwell with the del delivered people. And their response is in that song to prepare a dwelling place for the Lord. So God's counsel there is one thing, but the response of a willing people is there to prepare it. But then we see they place themselves under the law. And we did not deal with that, but if you read these chapters, we see that on the basis of their own law keeping, everything is lost. But nevertheless, God continues then from chapter 25 to show what he has in mind. And so, he wants to dwell among his people. And I cannot repeat everything we have said. Uh, many of us are familiar with computers these days. When you boot up the computer, everything is there. It's available, it's ready in the memory, it's accessible. And I hope that all the information we have gone through in this book and from other scriptures as well, can be, is available, can be used by the Holy Spirit 
that you understand the teaching of this chapter. We cannot repeat all the time, but you have to see the connections in order to have the benefit. And so we have seen, uh, I mentioned it last time, God comes out, reveals himself in glory, gives then the priesthood in chapter 28, 29 to bring man into his presence. And actually, the priests are introduced into the presence of God. And then we have seen what their occupation is in chapter 29, what they do there. But then you have seen in chapter 30 that this whole service is supported by the altar for the burning of incense. That has to do with access, free access to God. That has to, be, to do with priestly service and is supported by the altar for the burning of incense. And with that, the whole section closes in chapter 30 verse 10. But then we see some very important additions. You've seen last time from verse 11 to 16, it is for a numbered people, a people held by God, a people on the, which is there on the basis of redemption, on behalf of whom this whole service goes on. And we have seen, on the one hand, we are the people of God. We like to make the application. We are not under the law, but we like to take up these things in the spiritual meaning, the spiritual meaning, and then we are the people of God, on, whom, on uh, behalf of whom a priestly service is being done. But we have seen also we are priests. We are together with the great priest, the great Aaron. And we have priestly service. And that is what we have seen from verse 17 to verse 21. There we see provisions necessary in order to have access as priests in the presence of God, to serve in the presence of God. But in a sense it was negative. It was to take away defilement. It was to take, uh, to, to purify. But now we come to a portion, and that's the, the fourth time that we read Jehovah spoke to Moses. It's an, a, a different supplement to introduce something very positive. I would like to compare the washing of the hands and the feet with what we have in 1 Corinthians 1, where the word of the cross is applied. The water always speaks of the word of God, the power of the word, in its cleansing power. And there we see how the word of the cross takes away what is of the first man. But then chapter 2 we see, and at the end of chapter 1 already, 1 Corinthians, it is in order to introduce a new order of things. It's in order to introduce the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's in order to introduce the Holy Spirit who would take the things of Christ and apply them. And that is now what we have in the section before us. First of all in connection with the anointing, the ointment, and the anointing oil, the holy anointing oil, there you see how God would introduce something which is entirely for his own pleasure, which we find in connection with the Spirit of Christ. And then the last portion we have read, in verse 34 to the end, we see another aspect. There we see what is entirely for God. So we hope to see tonight in connection with the anointing oil, that there is something for God, that there is a testimony for God here on earth, and it has to be entirely according to his thoughts. But then we have, at the end of the chapter, something which is for God, specially for God, these, these fragrant drugs and incense. We'll see in a moment. Now, you have to remind yourself constantly that all these things, although they were given in the context of the first covenant, are an illustration for us, because we, are, we have a relationship with God. We are his people. Uh, believers from the Jews, believers from the Gentiles are both brought together to be one people. And we have a special relationship with God. And according to 1 Corinthians 10, we see that all these illustrations have been given for our good, for our benefit, for reproof, if necessary, to correct us, but also to instruct us. First of all, to instruct us, and then to correct us, if necessary. And then to introduce, in a practical way, Christ. The Holy Spirit to take these illustrations really to introduce Christ in a very practical way. That is the force of Second Th Timothy 3 verse 16. I just mentioned that every scripture is divinely inspired and profitable for teaching, profitable for conviction. We need to be convicted. The word of God has to have an effect in us. Not only just a presentation of the truth that's necessary, but then this has to have an effect in you and me. We have prayed for that. Then, for correction, we are going through the wilderness as we have sung. There's a lot of failure and shortcomings, so we need correction. But 
this correction is for instruction in righteousness. That means, really, that Christ may be formed in us. That something, according to God's thoughts, will be formed in us. And now in that context, I would suggest to you that the Holy Spirit would take the illustrations of the Old Testament in order to make things real in us, in order to form Christ in you and me. That is the power of the illustrations, not just to present something, but in order to make these things effective. Now when we go over these verses here, we will make a few references to other passages. On the one hand, it's very simple if you grasp the idea. Here is everything for God and everything that God can put his hand on, so to speak. Everything God can identify himself with. Anointing was for public service. And in order to understand this, I would like to refer to um, Matthew 3, where we see the Lord Jesus, how he was baptized, and then went up from the waters, and then the Holy Spirit came down in the bodily form of a dove, and rested upon him. And Acts 10, verse 38 says, that this is how God anointed the Lord Jesus. So please keep this in mind. Uh, it is good to uh, connect all this teaching with the person of the Lord. So I repeat, Matthew 3 speaks about his baptism, and then consequently the descent of the Holy Spirit who would find a dwelling place upon him. Of course the Holy Spirit dwelt in the Lord Jesus. He was, in Luke 1 we see that he was that holy thing which was introduced into this world through uh, a special intervention of the Holy Spirit. And we have seen in uh, Exodus 29 with these different cakes, the cakes were uh, 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 penetrated by the oil and also covered with the oil. Now here the anointing is what is put upon uh, the Lord Jesus. That goes together with these cakes, anointed with oil, poured oil, the, pour, the oil was poured over. And in Acts 10 verse 38 it says, Jesus, who was of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went through all quarters doing good and healing all that were under the power of the devil and so on. So this anointing here was for public service. And so the anointing of the tabernacle there in the wilderness was for the service of God in this world. There is a clear parallel. And so you have to discern, to distinguish this from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, of the new birth, operated through the Holy Spirit, the fact that we are clothed with the Holy Spirit in many other ways, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The anointing has to do with this public service for the pleasure of God. And we find uh, also a reference in Luke 4, Lord Jesus came out of the wilderness and was led by the Holy Spirit, and was full of the Holy Spirit. There you have another uh, thought. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He was anointed first, prepared for service, but then also full of the Holy Spirit. And then he spoke. And from his anointed lips, these wonderful words of God's grace poured out. And we come back to that idea of pouring. They were These words poured, were poured out from his heart and from his lips. In Luke 4, you can read that. Wonderful grace of God. Now, what God accepts in connection with his dwelling place is Christ. God can only accept something of this new order of man. You have understood the first order is gone. God introduces a new order of man, Christ. And everything bears the stamp of Christ. And here we see then different aspects. We, will, we go over the details now of these uh, components, these spices first, how this anointing oil was made, prepared, and then we'll talk a little bit about the purpose of this anointing oil. But please keep in mind, and that is always very helpful also for our young people, that these things are also and always related to the person of our Lord Jesus. We have seen that the tabernacle speaks of the Lord Jesus as God's dwelling place. It also speaks of the, of the assembly, of the church of the living God as God's dwelling place. But then everything speaks of Christ. And now these spices, which were components of this ointment, speak in a very special way of his humanity. The spices were really extracts from plants very exotic plants in general, very special plants. And these plants would uh, speak then about the Lord Jesus, the fruit of the earth. In Isaiah 53 you find him as the fruit of the earth. From barren land he sprang up for God. And so these different plants would speak of different qualities we find in the Lord Jesus in connection with humanity here on earth. Something he produced, a new order of man. He produced that for God. And God's going to take these qualities, going to use these qualities in connection with this tabernacle system. The best spices. Uh, the word best here is related to the word head. It is top quality. 
Nothing else can satisfy God's heart. Liquid myrrh is the first mentioned. This comes from a tree, and usually they make incisions in the tree, and then this myrrh comes out. Now, in connection with this process, we think of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus. These incisions speak of what he went through. And these sufferings produced something very precious for God, this myrrh. You find the myrrh in many, many passages. Psalm 45, you find it mentioned first. The glories of the king are mentioned there. Also, the cassia, the cassia as we find here, aloe, uh, but the myrrh first. When the Lord came into this world, he had to suffer. But through his sufferings, he produced something which was very pleasant for God, very acceptable, very precious. It would be a study in itself, you would go through the scriptures to study the myrrh, and especially the liquid myrrh, which uh, even has a more, is more rare and has a higher quality than normal myrrh. You find it in the book of Song of Songs and other places. 500 shekels. I'm not sure what the meaning of 500 is, but I suggest in connection with five, it has to do with responsibility. Here he grew up in this world and produced something for the glory of God and answered in every way in fullness to man's responsibility. There was no failure in the Lord Jesus, not at all. And in Ephesians 5 we see that everything was for the glory of God. And then there is a second component of sweet cinnamon and a third of sweet myrtle. We don't, we, the only thing we know is that these plants probably came from long distance. And a suggestion would be here, here we find the Lord Jesus not only as the one who was here on earth, a man on the earth compared with a plant growing here. These plants also grew here, the myrtle and the cinnamon, but they came from far away. And the suggestion there would be, we have in the Lord Jesus a man from heaven. He is perfect man, but he comes from far away. Perfect man, but he came from far away. A heavenly man. Uh, John 3, he speaks with Nicodemus and he says, the Son of Man, he spoke here to Nicodemus here on earth, who is in heaven. A mystery. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he is the man from heaven. And then, to, uh, we notice here, two times, sweet. The Lord Jesus represents an order of man which is sweet in God's nose, as it were. Sweet in God's perception, in God's appreciation. Very sweet. Then the fourth component is cassia. The cassia we find, as I said in Psalm 45, a little bit different word, but probably the same material, same substance. Then we find it in John 19, in connection with the burial of the Lord Jesus and his resurrection. And so, it, it connected with his going out of this world. Even when he went out of this world, that was an occasion that he produced him, that he showed something which was so precious for God. So his sufferings, all during his life, I read again this track by Brother Darby about the sufferings of Christ. It's worthwhile to read and reread it again and again. There you have the myrrh. But the cassia, I would also connect this, is going out of this world. And his personal greatness. In the book of John, we don't find the, the cassia mentioned in the other Gospels. But in John's Gospel, we find the personal glories of the Lord Jesus. And there we have the cassia and the alloy. The alloy may suggest something he always kept. When he came into this world, when he went through this world, when he left this world, the alloy was always there. But maybe the cassia, especially in connection with his going out. However this may be, we find these four components in connection with his manhood put together. Only God can distinguish all these different qualities as we have in the Gospels, the four Gospels. But then they are put together, blended together in this olive oil. In the olive oil, as we have seen, does not only speak of light, we have seen that in Exodus 25 and 27, how the olive oil speaks of the activity of the Holy Spirit, a product of the Holy Spirit. There is this hymn, a fullness, a complete uh, quantity, and we see then that these substances are mixed with this olive oil. And again, this is a reference to the perfections of the Lord Jesus, perfect man, but entirely controlled, led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the oil, the oil is in every substance, connected with every substance. The most minute detail was characterized by the oil. And now I want to make a leap, okay? Often we have to do this in our minds. What was true for the Lord Jesus here on earth, God wants to be true for you and me. I would refer the olive, in the connection with the olive oil to Zechariah 4. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. 
And the end of Zechariah 4, you see there this little remnant, the faithful remnant, and they are called sons of the oil. Did you ever notice that in Zechariah 4 at the end? That is what God has in mind for his people, that they would be sons of the oil. Zechariah 4, these are the two sons of oil that stand before the Lord of the whole earth. That is, they represent the remnant there in Judea, in Jerusalem. And so, the believers today are like a remnant that God wants you and me to be sons of oil, characterized entirely by the Holy Spirit. That was true for the Lord Jesus. But what was true in him, God wants to work out now in our lives. So there's a practical application you may make. You can think also of 1 Corinthians 2. I really encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 2, where you see how these wonderful treasures of the wisdom of God have been made available through the Holy Spirit. He communicates and he makes these things available. So, the all of all, we see in the connection with the Lord Jesus, again I refer to Luke 1 and other passages, but now the same principle applies to the believer today. So you have seen four and one, these four different substances put together, blended together in the oil, that we see then the Lord Jesus in his perfect humanity, but also under the Holy Spirit and through the Holy Spirit. So make, uh, verse 25, make of it an oil of holy ointment. There are many references. I have a few books for those who are interested, uh, where we have many, many details about this, uh, this uh, ointment. Very interesting, but we cannot go through all these details now. We'll just uh, continue this chapter. A perfume, I want to underline this now, a perfume of perfumery. There we see... There is a composition. These different elements are blended together, as we hope to see also in connection with the incense, and according to a very special process. Now, of course, the Holy Spirit uh, composes these qualities, brings them together in connection with the person of the Lord. But if you understand now that the Holy Spirit also is working in you and me, uh, then he is very skillful in working out, in, in bringing all these qualities also together in your and my life. Connected with the ointment, I'd like to refer to another very special verse in the Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 3. Thine ointments savor sweetly. Thy name is an ointment poured forth. So here we see the name of the Lord Jesus compared with an ointment poured forth. So what he said was under the control of the Holy Spirit. Every word was characterized by the Holy Spirit. But then also at the beginning of the verse, thine ointments savor sweetly. You remember this word sweet two times? The, uh, the components, the cinnamon and the myrtle. And so even the entire mixture of ointment savors sweetly. How precious this is for God. And so he uses this to, as it were, to put these qualities, and we go to see that now in the next verses, on this tabernacle system. But before we go there, I'd like to make a reference now to First Chronicles 9. There were people who had ability to prepare this ointment. In First Chronicles 9, verse 30, there you see uh, special Levitical priests and Levites for all kinds of services in connection with the tabernacle and later on with the, in connection with the temple. But then it says in verse... 29, part of them also were appointed over the vessels and over all the holy instruments and over the fine floor and the wine and the oil and the frankincense and the spices. And it was some of, someone of the sons of the priests who compounded the ointment of the spices. Here's a challenge, beloved. Are we like sons of priests who have the ability to compound the ointment of the spices? Not for our own uh, benefit, as you see at the end of the chapter, but for the glory of God, to have an idea of what is precious for God, to, as it were, to, to understand God's thoughts in connection with the Lord Jesus, in connection with this precious ointment. There were people who had special abilities. And we hope to see in the next chapter, the next time, Lord willing, in chapter 31, how God gives these abilities. Okay, but just this reference, and it might be a challenge for us to study the Word, to see how these precious elements are composed and put together in a work. Psalm 45 also speaks about this composition. It's a composition. That means all these different aspects are blended together under the skillful work of the Holy Spirit. So here's a challenge for you and me. And even in Day of Decline, in Nehemiah 3, you find people working there at the wall. There were also perfumers after the work of the perfumer. Now about this ointment where it was 
fruits. I was thinking of Acts 2 in connection with us, where we see that Lord Jesus is also anointed now as man in the glory. And we have to understand there are two ways in connection with this ointment. The ointment was poured in its fullness over the Lord Jesus. But the part of the tabernacle here, and also in connection with the priest, they were anointed. There was just a, a little uh, touch, often in the form of an X, was uh, applied of this anointment oil. The difference is the fullness is in the Lord Jesus. Here on earth, as we've seen in X 10, verse 38, and the fullness of this ointment is on his head in the glory. But it doesn't stay there. It comes down to us. Psalm 133. You remember Psalm 133? Where this ointment comes down. It comes down. And so the oil is poured on the Lord Jesus. But then the ointment comes down to you and me. That is the idea. And so that gives us a place in connection with this. Unity. This is a unity. And then we see also that God wants to anoint all these parts of the tabernacle because they have a special meaning for himself. And every item has to be set aside for this particular purpose God has in mind. And the anointing is necessary that it can function according to God's ideas in the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you read Psalm 133, Acts 2, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, you can think of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How he brings us together and places us on a new foundation, on a new, introduces into a new realm where everything is characterized by the Holy Spirit. You will understand this. Now, verse 26, thou shalt anoint the tent of meeting. There are seven elements here mentioned. We go over them briefly. But before we do, I just want to repeat this, what we have seen. We have seen that a, a willing people brought all the needed substance. And we have said, mentioned first. When we started Exodus 25, we had first the ark. But now we see here that the ark would uh, be kept in connection with the tent of meeting. So the tent of meeting is mentioned first, that God would meet his people. But there's a reference to that also in verse 36, before the testimony, in the tent of meeting where I will meet with thee. I hope to come back to that in a moment. So the tent of meeting is mentioned first. And also when you see how Moses sets up the things, a little bit later on, chapter 36, 37, the tent of meeting is mentioned first. Now think of our tent of meeting. Today, uh, the assembly, the, the church of the living God is God's tent of meeting. Ephesians 2 says that it's the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And in connection with that dwelling place, the ark is mentioned first. The ark is the center. So we have the whole dwelling place characterized by the Holy Spirit. And then we have the center of this dwelling place. The ark, which speaks in such a wonderful way of the Lord Jesus. But we go through the wilderness, and therefore it's called the ark of the testimony. We have seen that when we studied Exodus 25, all these different names of the ark is really a study worthwhile to do to help us to understand more of the glory of the Lord Jesus. But as we have seen in the, in the hymn, we go through the wilderness, and so there the ark is a testimony, testimony for God. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, it was anointed, by this oil. And the table, which speaks of the unity of God's people. Think of Ephesians 4, the unity of the Spirit. It speaks of this wonderful communion. But it is only possible according to the unity of the Spirit and under His anointing. And then we have the fourth point, the lampstand and its utensils. It's all characterized by the Holy Spirit. This light, as we have seen in chapter 27, the light is also produced by the Holy Spirit. And then the light is Christ, also, of course. Then the fifth uh, point is the altar of incense. We have seen how the altar of incense was necessary to support this whole tabernacle system. And the whole service there is in the power of the Holy Spirit. Then the sixth point, the altar of burnt offering. We think of Hebrews 9, verse 14, where the Lord Jesus offered himself up through the Holy Spirit, through the eternal Spirit. So also the altar of burnt offering is characterized, anointed here, by the Holy Spirit, by the oil, all its utensils, and then the labor which was necessary to carry on the service in, in, the, in the inside was also anointed by this oil. So in other words, you cannot have anything in connection with the tabernacle service when it is not anointed. God cannot accept it when it is not anointed. And we come to that now in a moment. But before we go there, just verse 29 now, three points. Thou shalt hallow them, 
So that means they are now set apart for a very special purpose. The second point is that they may be most holy. So because of the application of the ointment, God gives a very special meaning to these uh, utensils and vessels and instruments. They are for Him, and therefore they are most holy now. And then God has identified Himself with it. They enter to God's holy claims. Everything is according to His thoughts. The third point, whatever touches them shall be holy. That shows the degree of holiness of these vessels, that they are so precious and have such a special value for God that they can even, uh, according to this instruction, make holy that which touches it. So whatever would touch these vessels would also be set apart for God. Now we come to verse 30. There we have the eighth category of anointing. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt anoint. Now you remember from chapter 29, Aaron was anointed first alone. The anointing of his sons was not mentioned in Exodus 29. Only the water and the blood was mentioned. But here we have the anointing. And think again of what I mentioned in Acts 2. Uh, think also of uh, Hebrews 8. The Lord Jesus is the great uh, minister of the sanctuary. He is anointed there above his uh, companions. But the companions are anointed also. They Uh, the oil comes down on them as well. That is the idea here. And I shall hallow them. So we have here a new priestly family set apart for God, but also anointed, all under uh, the power of the Holy Spirit, that they may serve me. So I repeat again and again, because God cannot accept anything else. He sets the stamp of his approval, as it were, on all these uh, elements of the service. And on all these activities, it's under the stamp of his approval. Now we come to verse 31. And thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. Now there's a challenge for our young people and children, the next generation. What is the challenge? A holy anointing oil said this be unto me throughout your generations. It is God's portion. It's all for him. I mean, if you start to realize that this whole service, tabernacle service, is for God, you have learned such an important lesson. The fact that we are here together, that we are in this world, is for God's glory. Not for you and me, it's for Him. And so God wants the next generation to grasp this, and also to be under in the good of these things, under the power of the holy anointing oil. God wants to maintain this. You know, in a public way, in an outward way, He will do this in the millennium. You can go to Ezekiel and you see that many of these things will be set up in a public way in the millennium. But now, in a moral way, God wants this to continue through all the generations of believers. So there's a challenge for every generation. But now we come to a very solemn portion. Verse 32. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. Why not? Do you understand that? God has condemned man's flesh. If you want to reintroduce man's flesh in the service of God, that's the worst thing, not the worst thing you can do. And that is what the Corinthians tried to do. First Corinthians 1. The cross, they had accepted the cross, they had accepted the gospel, and now they wanted to introduce something of the flesh. Paul says, no, no. God cannot put the stamp of his approval on the flesh. It's impossible. Neither shall you make any like it. There is no imitation. That's the second danger. In, it's in, for the human heart, for, for every Christian, a danger. That we would introduce something of the flesh and try to get God's approval of that uh, upon the flesh. No. Or that we would imitate certain things. When you go to uh, Proverbs 7, verse 17, there you have the wicked woman, which represents really the Christian profession, in, in unfaithfulness, becoming unfaithful to the true husband, and she has all these things. It's all there. But it is imitation. It's not for the glory of God. So we really have to watch it. And then it says, it is holy, at the end of verse 32, that it is objective value. It is holy. These things are holy for God. Cannot be uh, mixed with the flesh or with anything of man. But then it says, it shall also be holy unto you. So we have to grasp God's thought. If, if God says, the flesh profits nothing, if God says, the flesh is enmity with God, do I accept it? Or do I try to find a compromise? No, here it says, it shall also be unto you. So, we have really to understand God's thought, that God has crucified the flesh, condemned the flesh, but then introduced a new order of things in connection with Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, 
and so we should identify ourselves with this new order of things. In verse 33, whoever compounded any like it, or whoever put this any of it upon any strange thing, shall be cut off from his people. You see, whoever compounded any like it, that might be the effort of the religious man to organize things according to his own ideas, and then to cover it up with something which would outwardly answer to God's thoughts. That's really what you have in verse 33. God says, it won't work. The man who does that shall be cut off from his peoples. You can think about this. It's a very solemn warning. Now, we come to the last portion of, this, of tonight, this chapter, where we have then for the fifth time, and Job has said to Moses. So please keep in mind the context. God introduces here very, very precious things. So we have seen in connection with the anointing oil that God sets this system up for himself and identifies himself with it. I would like to give another reference that you understand the meaning of this. In 1 Samuel 16, they have the first order of man in Saul, the man after the flesh. God says to Samuel, no, I don't like that order. And then Samuel, he goes there and he sees Eliab and he sees another brother of David. He says, my, that's, that's God's man. God says, no, no, it's not my man. And then he comes to David, a little, he was small, and God says, it's not the outward appearance. God looks what's in the heart. And he saw that David was a man after God's heart. That is really the new order of things. And God reserved the anointing oil for the new order of things. First Samuel 16, you can read about it. It's wonderful. And so this anointing oil, really, we have to understand, is connected to this new order of things connected with the Lord Jesus, and we are identified with this new order of things, which is for the pleasure of God in this world. But now we come to a next step, that in connection with the incense, that we have free access to God. You remember that the author of uh, incense speaks of access to be in the very presence of God, so that brings us even closer to God. The anointing oil is in connection with public service, is a testimony for God here in this world, that God can approve it. But now when you come to the, to the fragrant drugs, it has to do with this altar of incense, where everything is in connection with the presence of God, the immediate presence of God. And so when we come here to these components of these fragrant drugs, we come to things which are even more difficult to understand or to define. First of all, these words we find there in verse 34 are not found elsewhere in the Bible. And so we really don't know exactly what they mean. And is there not a reference to the person of the Lord Jesus? We may study the Lord, we may study the Gospels, we may study the Psalms, but can you ever come to a point that you say, now I got it, I understand it, I have grasped it, I know it all. Would you ever come to that point? Uh, read Judges 13. We were... We had a Bible study uh, in Niagara on the Lake this morning, and there we have seen that his person, his name is wonderful. He's beyond our grasp, our comprehension. If we could understand God, then we should be God. Only God can understand who he is. A creature, how blessed, how privileged we may be, we can never really understand who God is. But we can worship, we can fall down before him, we can understand that he is so great. And so when it comes also to the incarnation, how God has come, become man. It's a mystery, but a revealed mystery. A mystery we accept by faith. When it comes to the Trinity, it's a revealed mystery. We accept it by faith. When it comes to the Lord Jesus in the glory, who can understand? A man in the glory, in heaven, who could place himself at the right hand of God. Wonderful. Who can understand the depths of his suffering, the sacrifice, all these elements, the burnt offering, the sin offering, you, you can go on. All these different elements. Who can understand this really? We can study the scripture and we understand more, but we never really can know the things as God knows. And I, my suggestion would be, in connection with these fragrant drugs, we see special qualities in the Lord Jesus which only God really knows. But we may understand a little bit. The stack they mentioned here first is a word we find the similar, uh, the root of this word you find elsewhere also, and it would mean dripping, something which drops, or dripping, drips, uh, rather, dripping. So there we may think of this 
speaking of the Lord Jesus, the outflow of his speech, as we find in Psalm 45 and look for, then the Onika uh, would refer to shell, to mollusks, to shell uh, animals. And the shells would be crushed and then produce this fragrant, fragrant drug. Maybe there's a reference to the sufferings of the Lord, but and also to the sufferings in death, this crushing process. And there God produced something which was so precious for him. Then the galbanum seems to be a component which was used to sustain the value of the other uh, fragrant drugs. So it gave value to it all. Maybe there we can think of the energy of the Lord Jesus, spiritual energy, holy energy for God. However, we can never say dogmatically, it's dead, it's dead, it's dead. Only God knows exactly. And the number three would also speak of this fullness we find in the person of the Lord. But then the three is combined with one. Maybe we can think also of the fact that the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit together reveal themselves in the person of the Son. In Colossians 1 we see that the, it pleased the Trinity to dwell in Him here on earth and it pleases now the fullness of the Godhead to dwell in a bodily form in the Lord Jesus, in the glory. So three in one, or three and one, because now these three elements are mixed with this pure frankincense. What is frankincense? Frankincense, the word literally means what is white. And so there we see how the Lord Jesus was transparent. Did you ever read in John 8 where he could say, I am what I say. So in other words, what the Lord said, he really was. And what he was, was expressed in what he was saying. This transparency, this purity. This whiteness, which is so precious for God. And so, the Holy Spirit would take that, this purity. Think of Leviticus 2, where you find, uh, in a different setting, then of course, the meal offering. But there you find this frankincense also. And did you notice that, that the frankincense was entirely for God? And that helps us to understand what the meaning is of this portion. There are things here which are entirely for God. And so it has to do with our access, as we see in connection with the altar. But... This thought what is entirely for God. But now you see that these elements are put together in like proportions. Who can fathom that? This evenness in the Lord Jesus, this balance, and all these different qualities were always balanced in a perfect way. When you see him as the perfect servant, he is still the eternal son. When you see him as the king, he is still a servant. When you see him as the priestly son, he is also the eternal son. I mean, and he is always in balance. He does not take away something of the one quality and then overemphasize the other quality? No. When you go to his love, for example, his love always maintained God's truth and light. His mercies were always in balance with other aspects. There is this wonderful balance. And so the Holy Spirit would blend this together in one, in a wonderful unity, which is a mystery in itself. Where only God can really, can really understand this and and uh, search this. Now verse 35, And thou shalt make it into incense. So now you see how these elements have been put together, but now they get a very special function for incense. Now incense is applied in two ways, by burning or by beating, in verse 36. And there are many passages where you see, where this, uh, which speak about this burning of incense. Maybe I can give you one passage, there are a lot of them, but... In Malachi 1, you have a passage that God speaks in a day of decline and he refers to what will go on in the millennium. He says, he speaks about his name, which will be great. Malachi 1, verse 11, For from the rising of the sun, even unto its setting, my name shall be great among the nations. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name and a pure oblation. So, this is helpful. Incense shall be offered unto my name. Now, I want to make a free application here. What God accepts from you and me is only this instance. It's the excellences of the person of Christ. I try to describe a little bit. The excellences of his blessed person which are presented to God. We have free access to God. And then we come and we present this instance which was entirely for God. The frankincense was entirely for God. So this instance is for God. But the wonderful point is here. It comes from every place. In the millennium, that will be true. From every place, this ancient shall be offered unto God's name. And his name will be great. 
But we are living in a day, an age, that we have the privilege to do it already now, in a moral way. So, let's take up the challenge, in every place, here in Devonport, or wherever we live, that from every place, this incense may rise up to God for his delight. For the priestly service, in Deuteronomy 33, you find one of the functions of the priest is that they would put this holy incense under God's nostrils. He wants to smell it. God wants to absorb, <coughs> excuse me, absorb these wonderful qualities of the Lord Jesus. What a joy it is for God to have the Lord Jesus in the glory as the minister of the sanctuary. But what a joy it is that if you and I could bring something of this incense, it's nothing of self, it's nothing for the glory of man, it's all Christ, his fragrance, his beauties. And therefore I suggested this hymn 499, presented to God in worship and adoration. It is through him. May I give you two verses also in connection with this. First Peter 2 verse 5, where we see this priestly uh, service we have. And we offer these sacrifices. We may bring the bird offering, we may bring other aspects of the sacrifices to God. But then it says, through him. You, I want to analyze it. Through him. There you have the incense. The Lord is so precious for God that when we come to him, this is free access we have, Hebrews 10, verse 19 and so on, but we come through the Lord Jesus. We come in the value of this incense. When God smells this incense, as it were, he accepts us. He gladly accepts us until we may come to him in liberty with this incense. You remember, uh, or before I say that, I'll give you one more verse, Hebrews 13, verse 13 and following, where we see our service, our priestly service to God is also through him. We offer up sacrifices through him. It's in the value of this instance. But now I want to refer back to an Old Testament illustration, Leviticus 16. Do you find on the great day of atonement, the high priest coming into the holy place. And what does he bring there? First of all, he brings the incense. So there you have this free access. Well, of course, the Old Testament was very limited. There was no real free access yet. But Hebrews explains that to us. But the point is, the incense was there, presented in the presence of God. And the holy, the, the high priest could come there in the value of the incense. He was not killed. God accepted him in the value of the incense. And of course, that's a beautiful illustration how the Lord Jesus can come in the value of his own blessed person in the presence of God. And God is delighted to receive him. But understand, please, that these different uh, components of this wonderful mixture pass, uh, surpass our capacity, are beyond our capacity. Uh, but think of Matthew 11, verse 27, for example, nobody knows the Son but the Father. But then we see also in Matthew 16 that the Father delights to reveal the Son. So he wants to reveal the Son. But how everything is exactly, we cannot grasp with our analytical minds. We are too small for that. We can only fall in worship before him. Now a few words for the, the last verses before us. I think there is also holy exercise necessary. It's amazing to see that this... Uh, Incense was prepared and had to be salted. The salt would speak of the rights of God and also of preservation. You find in Leviticus 2 a reference to this salt that uh, every sacrifice should be salted with salt, Mark 9. But also Leviticus 2 speaks of the salt of the covenant. God wants to maintain his rights. We live in a world full of corruption and so only the salt can preserve these things. God wants to preserve these precious things and therefore you need the salt. It's for preservation. And so, that is important uh, in connection with separation from evil and so on, to be in the good of these things. It takes real exercise to keep these things and to have them ready for God. And also this purity, practical purity, is necessary. It's emphasized also in Leviticus 24 in connection with the incense and in connection with the preparation of the lambs. And then holy. So this implies real exercise. Not just a form or... Uh, routine, but a real exercise to bring these things before God. Then verse 36 we find the other way that it was presented before God. Thou shalt beat some of it to powder and put some of it before the testimony. Maybe that is a reference also to Deuteronomy 33 that he would put this underneath God's nostrils, that God could smell it. But also think of uh, passages like Revelation 8. Uh, we refer to that in connection with the altar 
of burnt offering, uh, of uh, incense, where you find that the Lord Jesus, as a great angel there in heaven, takes the incense and adds it to the prayers of the saints, that they may be acceptable for God. But now, the point here in this verse 36, it's before the testimony. The testimony is with the ark, as we have seen. So there was the ark with the cherubim. The blood was applied there. And then before the testimony, this incense was applied. And that's what happened at the Great Day of Atonement, as I just mentioned, Leviticus 16. And that is now what happens to the Lord Jesus there, in the very presence of God, in the tent of meeting. And there, this wonderful incense is presented before God. But now there is one more thing I want to underline here in verse 36, where I will meet with thee. Okay? In those days it was literally, of course, with Moses. Moses had the privilege, as I mentioned earlier, he had always this free access, as we have now, free access. Literally, the tabernacle system, there was a limitation. Only Moses had this free access. And it was that he could commune with God, that God com could communicate his thoughts with him. And it would be worthwhile if you would take these passages, like chapter 25, where the ark is mentioned, and immediately God mentioned this meeting. God was looking forward, as it were, to meet Moses, to talk with him. Numbers 12, 12 it says that he would talk with Moses as a friend, as a friend. And then, of course, I come to the application for you and me. God delighted to have you and me in his very presence. When we come on the base of the accomplished work of the Lord Jesus, when we come with the incense, then God wants to communicate to you. That is what God is looking forward to communicate. Genesis 35, we have a restored Jacob. And what does he do in the presence of God in Bethel, the house of God? God talks to him. And according to Hosea, Jacob talked to God. And also in Genesis 35, Jacob talked to God. So that is this communion. In the holy presence of God, we may have this fellowship with God, this communion. That is really what God is looking forward to, where I will meet with thee. And when you read number 7, when the whole tabernacle system was set up, at the end of chapter 7, there we see the same mysterious word as it were. God spoke with him. But then it says, he spoke with him. And it can also be read, Moses spoke with God, and you can read it, God spoke with Moses, both ways. And when you come to Exodus 30, uh, 40, exclude, excuse me, when this whole tabernacle system is set up, the cloud fills the holy place, then we hear a voice, and the Lord spoke to Moses. And that is Leviticus, the whole book of Leviticus. When God starts to speak, about what did, does he speak? About whom does he speak? About the person of the Son. The whole book of Leviticus, as it were, is filled with these illustrations of the Lord Jesus. So when God would have us in his very presence, he would speak about his beloved son. Or when you would apply it in this literal sense, take it in a literal sense, the Lord Jesus is now in the presence of God, and he is the great prophet. God would speak to him, the great apostle, and then he would go out and speak to the people. And also in that sense it's true. The Lord Jesus is there in the holy place. God would speak with him, reveal his thoughts, and then he would reveal his thoughts to us. It's something similar to 1 Corinthians 2, how the Holy Spirit takes the deep things of God, the wisdom from the wisdom of God, and then communicates them through the apostles, even with you and me. Wonderful riches we find there. From the very presence of God, he wants to communicate the secrets of his heart. That's really what God has in mind. So then the last verse is here, verse 37, the incense that thou shalt make, you shall not make for yourself. We understand that by now. Everything was for God. And you can only be happy, really happy, if you accept it, that everything is for God, and that you have a place in this whole system. Today we want to have something for ourselves, we will never be happy. But if we want to have everything for God, we will be happy. And then at the end of verse 37, it shall be unto thee, holy to Jehovah. That is the real connection. Of course, Jehovah in the Old Testament. We have now relationship is on a higher level with God, God as Father. But the same moral principle is true. It should be holy in connection with this relationship in connection with what God is in himself. Verse 38, whoever makes like unto it, to smell it, you see, it's not for us, it's not for man, shall be cut off from his people. He does not use then these things for the glory of God. And that is very solemn. When we take the things of God and want to use them for our own glory, to smell of it or whatever, we really take away God's portion. 
that is very serious. In 1 Samuel 2, there is also a reference to this incense, and then we see that in that same context, the people had taken away God's portion, and that was very serious. And God was going to introduce a new priest, a new order of priests, who would bring God's portion again before him. Well, you understand there are many passages you could read in connection with this, but I hope you have grasped the main flow of thoughts, and if not, please let me know your questions.